Now, um, another striking thing in the chapter is, is your dissatisfaction with the Parliament's role in the legislative process in general. And I think, if I can summarise, I think accurately, there are many reasons for that, but there seem to be two main reasons, if I can put the first first. Uh, that is that you don't think executive government explains the legislation to the parliament properly, it, and then it, 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 it doesn't take seriously the amendments that might be ra you know, raised on the parliament floor and so on. Can you speak a little bit about the, you know, the presentation of legislation to the parliament and what, how that process could be improved? Well, very often by the time legislation gets to parliament, it's been developed by a process within government. And quite often there's some consultation with interest parties and so on. Yes. And um, the, the authorising departments are involved and the ministers are involved and the drafting office is involved. And it, it's quite a process to, to get uh, legislation up to Cabinet and get it approved by the Cabinet. Um, and I think by the time government collectively has gone through that process, they think that, well, that's it. We've, you know, we've we've polished up this legislation to a state of perfection yes. and and uh, we don't want any damn fool members of parliament <laughs> trying to meddle with it. And um, I think there's a, there's a very adverse reaction to people in parliament you know, questioning it and saying, well, does this clause really do what it's intended yes. to do? There, there are explanatory memos which are presented to, um, to uh, the houses with legislation and Senate committees have been complaining for years that they're very opaque and they, they're designed to not tell you what's in the legislation. Yes. Um, so um, uh, when the legislation actually gets into the houses, the government wants it passed you know, as fast as possible yes. and with the minimum of, minimum of fuss and um, ministers get very impatient with explaining things and, and uh, deal, trying to deal with amendments and so on. And of course that in the House of Representatives, basically, the government shoves it through. Yes. Um, in the Senate, of course, you, the government, where it doesn't have the numbers, it has to put up with funny senators asking questions about it and moving amendments. I mean, sometimes the majority of the Senate might simply be opposed to that legislation and reject it. Um, and government will complain loud and long about that, about obstruction and so on. But that's a small minority of legislation. Yes. Um, with most legislation, uh, it's not projected out of hand, but uh, people move amendments. And um, it's sometimes a very long process in the Senate. And ministers have to explain why amendments are not acceptable. And, and do, you some... think, do you think, in your experience, does that process generally improve? Legislation. I, I believe so. Yes, and the, the best ministers I've seen over the years um, have accepted that. Uh -huh. um, they they tend to say, "Well, look, I don't really think there's a problem with this clause, but if you insist, we'll yeah. we'll draft our own amendment to get over the problem that you see." And um, you know, you know, they they ultimately are inclined to admit that, well, yes, you know. That was quite a useful process. Yeah. And particularly referring bills off to committees where people who have an interest in the legislation are able to come forward and express their concerns about it and point out problems with it. Um, the best ministers recognise that that's a good process uh -huh. as well. Yeah. Um, just, this is a, sort of almost a question about your kind of experience of daily life in the Senate. Does it make a very big difference to your work and to the sense of the Senate those odd occasions when the government has majority in the Senate, as the Howard government did in the last Senate? Well, yes, it, it, it does. And uh, um, my colleagues sometimes say, well, is the job worth doing anymore during the, those periods? But um, to, to go back to a period of government control, you have to go back to uh, 1981. 1976 to 81. Before that, you have to go back to the Menzies government yes. in the 1950s. And they were very different times. And um, none of my colleagues in those days asked themselves, is the job really worth doing anymore? Because um, although government had a majority, it didn't really have control. There were always senators who were interested in doing their job, mm. uh, their legislative job. 
and um, it was still the, the institution was still very much worthwhile. Yes. But um, where government really does exercise control, um, you see the legislative function going downhill. Yes. Um, government doesn't accept any amendments to bills, is impatient with any delay in the passage of bills, shoves them through, um, doesn't answer any questions it doesn't want to answer, uh, won't allow any committee inquiries into things it doesn't want to have inquiries into, and so on. Mm. And you really think, well, um, you know, the place is not performing the legislative function anymore. Yes. And that's and it's interesting to that your comparison with earlier periods where that didn't happen. It does show a, a different culture that is coming. Yes, yes. I, I think things things have changed. Yeah. Now, I, I think when one's talking about the legislative function of parliament, I think the even more fundamental question for me, and it's something that I find quite peculiar about the Australian Parliament, you touched on it earlier in a different way, is the fact that certainly in the House of Representatives, if a group of government backbenchers were to decide that a piece of legislation wasn't good and were to express that dissatisfaction, always on the Labor side but now also on the Coalition side, it's treated as a major crisis, as a yeah. want of confidence mm -hmm. in the government, a major political crisis, and 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 you know close to to the unravelling of government. Why has it, the Australian Parliament developed in quite unlike, you know, obviously quite unlike Congress, which is quite a completely different system, but also unlike Westminster, which is a similar system in many ways. Well, I, I just have to say it's a, a historical thing. It's grown up historically over many years. I think it goes back to the absolute discipline imposed by the Labor Party. In back the early in, days. Back in very early days. Yes. John Hurst, the historian, has a similar view to that, he thinks. Yes. It goes yes. back as long as that. Um, it goes back to signing the pledge. Yes. And members of the British Labor Party who come here are astonished by the caucus rule uh, that you are bound to vote for the party decision uh, in every case. Yes. And uh, they certainly have no such rule. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, there's great pressure on them to conform, and particularly when they're in government, to to support the government and not to kick over the traces. And there are all sorts of pressures that are brought to bear on them. But certainly, uh, backbench rebellions and even defeats of the government are not regarded as so the, unusual the as they are the here. Which, which I think is a healthy situation. Yes. Um, uh, you know, prime ministers have to be in the position of thinking that if they go too far, you know, their own people will rebel yes. and um, this could lead to a defeat. Do you have any reason to have confidence that the culture here might shift moving to something more like the Westminster system where a certain amount of toleration of dissent in the parliament is the order? Well, I think I would live in hope. Um, I think the, the Australian public is becoming more sophisticated and, and um, I think there's hope as a, as a you know, new generation comes, each new generation comes along, um, I think there is hope that that system will break down mm. um, and that um, people will be asked why they voted for things when they don't believe in them. Yeah. But it is, it's, it is a matter of hope. It's a matter of hope. There's, yeah. there's a hundred years almost mm. against it. But, no. but in, in the meantime, as, as long as you have the you know, Senate not under government control and have people there reminding everybody of what the legislative function properly is yes. and what we're here for, um, I think there's some hope. That yeah, and the Senate is crucial then in the... Absolutely, yeah. yes. Now, I must say, as a sort of... I've been a kind of, you know, observer of Australian politics for a long time and often becoming intensely interested in certain matters. Um, for me, the by far the most interesting things happen in Senate estimates committees. I mean, I, I honestly barely refer to a parliamentary debate to learn much, whereas I've found increasingly that if I want to learn about a particular issue, I go first to Senate estimates committees and then later to Senate committees or mm. sometimes joint committees. Mm. But what's been happening, I mean, perhaps because not everyone follows politics, He'll be watching this with the same degree of interest as, as I do and with the same knowledge as you have, to put it mildly. Could you say something about the Senate estimates process and mm -hmm. how it's evolved and under how much pressure it's come in recent times? 
Well, the, the Senate estimates process was established by a group of coalition backbenchers oh. in 1970. Um, basically, they were discontented with the scrutiny of expenditure and they said um, we must have a better means of scrutinising government expenditure, this business of just passing the bills through the chamber uh, when we're short of time and you know, rubber stamping them through is not good enough. Oh, no idea. And uh, over the years, um, the process of dealing with the estimates of expenditure had improved, but um, those coalition backbenchers were determined to get it off to a committee where um, people could ask questions directly of public servants uh, as well as ministers. And they basically brought pressure to bear on the government of the day um, and uh, established this um, process in the Senate. So it's McMahon government? Where that was 1970, that was uh, McMahon, yes. Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. Um, was it McMahon? Yes. <laughs> um, it, it was those independent government backbenchers. Right. And, uh, and government wouldn't have... And has it evolved since then as a, as a system? Because it's clearly well, it, when I read it, 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 it it's um, often not talking about money. It, it goes more broadly no, than no. that. No, um, but right, right from the start, it was a means of finding out what government was doing. Yeah. Um, and the questions often asked with started with uh, how much money you're spending on X, but then they develop into what are you doing with X and why, and um, why aren't you doing something different, and um, why has X failed? Yes. So, and, and that 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 started right from right from 1970. Um, senators realised that this was a great opportunity to find out about government programs and why they were not working. Yes. And if you were, you know, from the back blocks of Queensland and the farmers out there were very discontented with the Plague Locust Commission, and you could go along and ask the Plague Locust Commission why they weren't doing their job properly and what they were spending all that money on. So um, it, it developed into an all-purpose in inquisition into all government activities. But I take it from your chapter that in recent times you think it's come under considerable pressure. There's been an attempt by executive government to limit the um, workings of the estimates. I think over, over a succession of governments, ministers have said to themselves, this is not about estimates. You know, this, is, uh, this is not about how much money we're spending on what. This is, you know, goes way beyond that. And there have been attempts by ministers at various times to say, well, you know, this, these questions have nothing to do with the estimates and we don't really want to answer them. But um, they always had to face the possibility that they'd get into trouble in the Senate and they didn't control the Senate. Um, and, um, you know, the non-government parties could make a good deal of trouble for them in the Senate. And uh, they always had that restraint on them. So the the tendency was for them to complain but cooperate. Yes. But of course, um, when governments got majorities, and particularly the most recent period of that, um, that restraint was removed um, because you know, if someone attempts to do something to us in the Senate, well, you know, they won't succeed because we have the numbers there. So there was certainly a tendency for more and more refusals to answer questions. Um, and what, what are the standing rules on that? I mean, how easy it is, is it for, say, a minister to advise a public servant that he or she shouldn't answer that question? Well, the problem was that the public servants got the message that they needn't answer the questions either, and, and without even appealing to ministers, they were refusing to answer questions. Um, but there are no um, rules about it. There are a series of determinations that the Senate has made in the past, resolutions that the Senate has passed in the past, going back over many years. And, and both, basically those resolutions have said, if you want to ask, if you want to refuse to answer a question, you have to raise some public interest ground for, for doing so. You have to make out a case that there's some injury to the public interest involved in answering, in answering this yeah. question. And you have to satisfy us of the case. Yeah. And there's, a, there's an old resolution of the Senate that basically says, you know, we have to be satisfied that you, um, you have a case not to answer this question. 
Um, but um, you know, governments sort of tended to ignore that, um, and uh, particularly where they have a majority, of course, they can ignore it with impunity. Yes. And did that happen in the last period of the Senate? Yeah, yes. I mean, I mean, um, ministers and um, uh, officers were refusing to answer questions without raising any of those, you know, recognisable public interest grounds. Yes. Um, basically, because they knew they could get away with it. Yeah. And the the very significant uh, occasion was when the government said, "We are not going to answer any questions about the AWB affair." On what did they just because we've. It? Because we've appointed a royal commission, and the royal commission's inquiring into it um, under terms of reference that we determined in brackets, yes. which was of course of cause of some dispute, um, and so we're not going to answer any questions here. And they basically maintained that refusal. And that um, I kept pointing out that that is a very bad precedent because if government thinks that it can refuse to answer to the parliament simply be on the basis that there's a government-appointed inquiry into something, that is an extremely bad precedent yes. to set. Uh, and it's certainly not a, not a, a claim that's been accepted you know, by Senates in the past. Yeah. So um, I was very disturbed by that, but a lot of people couldn't work out what I was disturbed about. <laughs> and, and another thing that, I mean, I, that does come up in your chapter, um, when I was following the, um, the other famous kind of incident of recent times that the Senate got involved in inquiring into the children overboard affair. Um, and that was not estimate so much as a separate inquiry because the government didn't have control of the Senate and thus mm. an inquiry could be held. One of the things that I found very frustrating was that even the Senate committee into a certain maritime incident was not able to call key actors in the affair, which were the ministerial advisers. Mm -hmm. It was quite clear, mm -hmm. if you followed the narrative, that people advising Reef in particular mm -hmm. had played an absolutely vital role in, in suppressing evidence and distorting evidence mm -hmm. and so on. And yet, not a, they couldn't be called, am I right? In, they, they, the government refused to allow them to be called. And I didn't even feel strong pressure from Labor at that time to, to reverse that. Well, um, they they certainly could be called. They they had those people had no immunity about being called. There is a long-standing convention that the Senate doesn't seek to compel members of the House of Representatives. A matter of uh -huh. mutual respect between the houses, and, and vice um, versa. Yes, and 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 vice versa. But um, certainly, former ministers have no immunity from being summoned by the Senate and. Ministerial staff have no immunity, um, and in fact, there's no established rule of, apart from that convention about members of the House of Representatives, there's no established rule about anybody having any immunity. Uh -huh. But um, governments have always said, oh, you know, ministerial staffers are so close to the minister and they're, you know, privy to so many secrets, it'd be highly undesirable for them to be. That seems the reason that other people think it might be desirable. <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, the the committee a, a committee of course has no power to impose any penalty or try to compel people. The Senate um, has the power to try to compel people by imposing a penalty. They can arrest people and put them in jail ultimately. And I'm I'm always asked, you know, what can we do to these people who refuse to answer questions? And what can we do to a government that refuses to answer questions? And and I always say, well, we have the power to arrest and imprison, and they shrink from that, of course. Um, and that, that, that really is not effective with um, governments. It's good for um, um, uh, bluffing private witnesses, but yes. it isn't really, not really effective with governments. Um, and I think um, you know, the government would have tangled the Senate up in the courts for several years if they had um, gone down Try, the road yes. of trying to impose a penalty on the people concerned. Um, but then I say, well, there's a range of other things you can do. You can refuse to pass any government legislation until you know, these people front up. And uh, they, you know, they tend to shrink from that as well. You know? um, I think they think there would be a bad public perception of that. that um, 
there would be an adverse public reaction to that. Um, but, I, but I've always said that um, sooner or later there will be something sufficiently serious where a Senate will say to itself, well, this is so serious that we're going to go down some of those extreme mm. paths yes. Yes. Um, and uh, co you know, attempt to coerce a government to produce the information. And um, I, I refer to this as the Watergate moment when we, when we arrive at that yes. stage. Yeah. Uh, you know, some future Senate majority will say to itself, well, enough's enough, you know, we're going to go down one of those paths. But I think with the Children Overboard Affair, they, um, basically the opposition um, thought that extracting the political penalty was as far as they were willing to go at the time. Yes. And in a more general way, I think you think the, the parliamentary committee system could work a lot more effectively than in fact it does. Is oh, it, yes, yes. I, I mean, how could I it... So. What, what are the problems with it at the moment? Well, I, th I think um, uh, the committees themselves don't have sufficient um, uh, power to initiate their own inquiries. Um, the Senate committees actually do. They have a, they have a general reference to uh, scrutinise the performance of government departments and agencies, and if they use that to the full, that yes. would be a very... Yes. Powerful. These are the standing instruments. Yes, yeah. mm. that that would be a very powerful. And some some have used it in the past to look at particular agencies that they think need scrutiny. But um, I think they should be able to initiate their own inquiries, um, subject to you know the Senate directing them as to what they yeah. to do. Um, I think um, sharing chairs is a and, and between parties, going, between parties, and going beyond that, sharing um, majorities amongst parties too, um, is a useful device for uh, you know making the committees more um, multi-partisan. Yes, uh, making them parliamentary instruments rather than, than, than partisan instruments. You do say something really interesting, which is that no matter what reforms you instituted to try and revive strengthen, make more vibrant the committee system, in the end it relies on a change in culture because it's actually not even executive government so much as prime minister. There's so much concentration now in the hands of a prime minister mm. and that they, that the prime ministers are now going to manipulate behind the scenes mm. to make sure that the committee systems don't make life more difficult for the government than they want. Is that a fair summary of I think so. I, th I think we've now arrived at a point where Prime Ministers believe that they have to control everything. Um, basically, they are the people who won the last election. Uh, the party didn't win the election, the Prime Minister won the election. And that's, that's another problem, you know, the focus on leaders. Um, and in order to uh, make sure they don't lose the next election, they have to control everything and see that everything is run um, the way they think it should, um, and that everybody is on message, as the, as the phrase has it, you know, that they're all singing from the same song sheet and uh, nobody's rocking the boat. And over many years, Prime Ministers have built up the means whereby they do this, they seek to control everything. And through an enormously expanded Prime Minister's office with um, a last count in the last government, 40-odd personal prime ministerial staff. This is quite separate from the department. This is yes, the private office yes, of the prime minister. private office of the prime minister. Yeah. Um, people who are able, highly um, politicised operatives who are able to keep tabs on everything that's going on mm. in every ministry and, and all around the government and in the government backbench and are able to keep the lid on things and, and to make sure nobody's getting off message. Yes. And it's going to be very difficult to change that uh, now. And then um, you look at the role of the back benches. And um, the, um, there was a famous incident in the British Parliament where a backbencher had been given this question that he was to ask, you know, given by the Whip's office, this friendly question he was to ask. And uh, got up and said, when is the Prime Minister going to end this insidious process of handing out <laughs> servile, <laughs> grovelling questions. 
he wasn't very popular with his prime right. minister. But, right. but, uh, but um, you know, when a bank bench is going to rebel against this process of overweening control and, and do their own thing, well, then you start looking at the political parties and you start saying, well, the political parties have to change. Yes. You say something really interesting too, which is that um, you think there should be legal changes in regard to the constitution of political parties, that the way they're now constituted is deficient and, and helps the kind of crippling of a robust parliamentary tradition. Well, the, the, the people who study the parties tell us that you know, they have a very small membership base, that they are basically governed by very small groups of people uh, who govern the factions um, and there's enormous scope for you know, manipulation and enormous scope for um, conf conformity control, making yes. everyone sure that everybody conforms. And uh, traditionally, people in English-speaking countries have said, well, Westminster-type countries anyway, have said oh, parties are purely private organisations. You mustn't try to regulate parties. They're purely private organisations. But we have regulated parties now. We've We've said that parties must meet certain statutory conditions to get their names on the ballot paper. And it wouldn't be a big step to say you don't get your name on the ballot paper unless the electoral office is satisfied that you have followed democratic processes yes. for candidate selection and election of um, party bodies and so on. And uh, um, that, that would, you know, be a solution to some of the problems in political parties yes. anyway. You also think that both media and public opinion are lax, have not, have not exerted yeah. the kinds of pressure that is needed if you're going to have these big cultural shifts and the revival of, of um, the Yes, I think, I think um, you need a shift of, well, certainly a shift in the media. They have to stop treating dissidents among bank, public dissidents among bank benches as a great rebellion, you know, yes. threatening the life of the government and as a sign of weakness of the Prime Minister, you know, the Prime yeah. Minister can't control his followers. Yeah. And um, reporting it as if it's a sporting event where they're winning yeah, yes, losers. So. Yes, it's a power struggle, um, you know, if somebody doesn't toe the party line they must be after the leadership, etc, etc, etc. You know, the media has to change that. Yes change that. Uh, Is, are there any exemplars in the media that you've noticed that, that who do kind of look at it with, with, with outside the frame of the gallery? Uh, it's difficult to find them. Um, very, very, very difficult to find them. So um, it's a broad cultural shift in the media that's... Yeah, yes, I mean, you really need, do need a, a shift right across the board. Harry, can I ask you, you know, one of the things you do say is that um, public opinion is asleep often on the, on the um, defence of the parliament. I mean, how can it be revived? Can the public become a, a more vigilant in uh, defending the parliament? Well, it certainly has to be more vigilant, but um, more knowledgeable about parliamentary processes, what, what the parliament is there for. Um, I like to say to people, well, you, you know you're paying nearly two million dollars a piece for 150 yeah. members of the House of Representatives yeah. and 76 senators. Now what are you paying all that money for? And, and um, they have to um, you know, take the focus off the leader and voting for the leader and start thinking about the party and the party program um, and what members of the parties are doing yeah. and what their members of parliament are doing. Um, uh, the Americans have this great saying, you know, write your congressman. Yeah. And um, people have to get used to writing to their members of parliament and complaining yes. to them and thinking about what role their members of parliament are performing. And um, particularly asking their members of parliament why they voted for things that um, they didn't profess a great belief in. That would yes. be a very valuable thing for a lot of people to do. Yes. So there has to be a change of public attitude. But the media has to change first, I think. Yes. And just as the, the, perhaps the final question, if, if, or two questions I'd like to ask. The, the second last question is this. I, I mean, in, in looking at the way in which, even in today's conversation, but on many occasions you've spoken with such um, fearlessness, really, in regard to what you think government executive power does to the parliament. I mean, ha have you been under pressure in your, because you seem to me in some ways an old-fashioned servant of the parliament, 
And I don't know of anyone else in, in Australia who is in your kind of position and defends the parliament against executive government in the way you do. Are you seen as a sort of pest by prime oh, ministers oh, yes. and executive government? Oh, yes, yes, yes. And what, what you have to hope in this role is that you last through several changes of government because um, when people are out of government, they think you're a very valuable resource <laughs> and a person worth listening to. <laughs> um, so you have to hope for changes of government and to go through changes of government. But uh, yes, uh, I mean, um, when, when you're giving advice and uh, which doesn't suit government and when you're saying things about you know, making government accountable and the powers of the parliament as against government, you do make yourself unpopular with them, mm. with members of government and um, they do accuse you of being partisan, yes. um, which you're not. Yes. Um, but it's, a, it's something of a tradition amongst clerks of the Senate that goes back to my predecessors, um, and uh, I feel that I am old-fashioned, that I am following in that tradition of um, being the servant and the, in some respects, the spokesperson for the institution as against um, the executive government that may from time to time control it, um, and speaking for the institution too, sometimes against the the members of it. The present re in inhabitants of the institution. Yes, reminding the, reminding the inhabitants of the institution of their history yes. um, and the appropriate parliamentary way of looking at these things. Yes. Um, you know, occasionally in the situation of saying to people, well, you, you shouldn't accept that as an excuse for not answering a question. Senates in the past have not accepted that excuse. You shouldn't either. And, yes. you know, that can be seen as quite subversive and troublesome and and so on, but um, you know, it's all part of supporting the institution. Yes. And my final question, um, uh, I don't know whether you've yet formed an impression of the new Prime Minister, Mr Rudd, but the, <laughs> the book in which you have a chapter is Dear Mr Rudd, and, mm -hmm. and it uses the idea of addressing uh, the Prime Minister. Do you, do you have a feeling that he is a respecter uh, of the parliamentary traditions in the way that you would like? I think I'd have to say too early to tell. Uh -huh. um, certainly, um, he has propounded policies to improve parliamentary processes and accountability processes, um, but I think we have to wait and see. And finally, I'd like to thank you, and, and thank you not only for doing today's interview or conversation, which I've enjoyed thoroughly, but also for you know what is now a very long period of being, I think, the staunchest defender of the parliamentary tradition in this country. So I'd like to well, thank you for that. I well, thank you for another occasion to be so.